Oracles. Uh, we are Adam, Gorka, Mario. We work for Stanbury Labs, which is a company um, yeah, commissioned by the Women Foundation for the development and for the implementation of the first um, implementation of the Women Protocol. Um, the objectives of this um, session, uh, which is a sort of um, mixture between a talk and a mini workshop, are understanding what decentralized oracle networks are, what's their use, why we need them, uh, get to know radar and why we design it as it is uh, today, and learn how WinNet is using radar. Uh, we will show in how it works in, in real life. You will, you will see the code. And you will get a glimpse into what we are working, what we were, will be uh, doing next, and what's the future for radar, for WinNet, and for oracles. So, on decentralized oracles, okay. Uh, you know, you have a problem. Do I need to explain that anymore? <laughs> Probably every every single uh, of the people here already heard a lot about it. But okay, it's bullshit. It's just mama jam. It doesn't mean anything. It's not formalized. It's, it's not a problem that anyone has defined. It's just marketing. So what we're talking about, if you say the Oracle problem here, is that the fact that because smart contracts need to be deterministic, we cannot query external APIs or consume any uh, kind of non-deterministic data from within the smart contracts, so we need to do some way of, um, of resolving that kind of indetermination that arises from having some computation being performed on multiple nodes in a network or in all the nodes in a network, like is the case for smart contracts in, in Ethereum, and uh, at the end of the day, um, if we try to solve that through centralized data input, basically by having uh, a contract uh, have an owner that can uh, call a private method, let's say a method that has a modifier so that only the owner uh, can input data, we are breaking a uh, damper and censorship resistant, which is the, um, the goal of using the smart contract and we will we, be uh, between the purpose. Uh, so the question is how do you build determinism without centralization? That's, that's the problem that, we're, that we've been uh, trying to solve. So we came with the concept of a decentralized oracle network, where decentralized means that basically it's damper or sensor resistant, no one can decide which will, which, which will be the result of the contract. Uh, decentralization is just the way to arrive to that, uh, the best way we know. Uh, Oracle here means that there's an entity relaying information uh, to, to the contracts, um, and most importantly, uh, a determiner, basically uh, an entity that abstracts away the, the uncertainty that comes from making a HTTP query where you can uh, have many many different servers, network errors, uh, many different situations. If you query multiple APIs for the same for the same data, how do you solve the fact that they could be different and, and so on? That's that's the idea of the oracle. And the network here basically means that there's some pool of nodes that are randomly selected uh, for uh, making this work of retrieving, <coughs> aggregating, and delivering data into smart contracts. Okay, so uh, decentralized networks should be about splitting power, so as to mitigate trust in, in any uh, single node and in particular person, uh, so as to not have any single uh, point of failure. So um, when we thought that we needed to uh, find a way to, to have a DSL for oracles. Why, why are programming languages uh, that exist today not enough for something like a decentralized oracle? So uh, if we want to build determinism, uh, we require explicitness. So um, the code needs to be really, really clear about the intention of the of the request of the of the data request we are performing, uh, we don't want any ambiguity. Let's say, uh, of course, 
the human languages will not work. We cannot use natural languages for uh, saying, I want to know um, uh, the price of ETH uh, when compared to USD, or I need in my contract to know about the temperature in Osaka tomorrow, and so on. Uh, and most programming languages are also not suitable because they are too rich in their uh, control flow structures. So imagine, for example, Solidity. It allows you to do looping and many fancy stuff uh, that are, is not really required for the purpose of simply taking data from a uh, data point, transforming it in some way, act, making aggregations, making some statistics, some computations, and then having it del uh, delivered to your smart contract. So uh, we need something that is really, really focused on transformation, aggregation, uh, something that could be you could think of uh, more similar to the map reduce paradigm. So <coughs> when we started thinking of, of this DSL, we, we realized that uh, it needed to be abstract, so that it hadn't any specific syntax. It's not tied to any uh, syntax so that you don't need to learn a new language. The idea is that uh, this um, is simply like a kind of grammar for defining data flows and then you can have libraries in your programming language uh, that you like the most, uh, for example JavaScript or whatever, uh, that you can use uh, these libraries for writing uh, right on the screen. So uh, it's totally data flow oriented. It means that it's, it's like a pipeline. Uh, it's point free, so it's a sequence of operators that operate on the result of the previous one. And uh, it needs to be really, really focused on what we are doing, which is querying information, transforming it, and having it delivered. Uh, this is probably the most important part, uh, which is that it needs to be uh, statically analyst and analyzable uh, so that we can predict uh, the computing resources that you will, will, will be using so as to set some kind of uh, price model similar to, to gas or something like that uh, and to also to detect any kind of wrong incentives that we will see later or security issues that could arise from uh, malformed queries. So uh, we introduced Radon in the 2017 White paper as a language that includes uh, most of the, of the features that uh, I just explained. And Radon basically uh, stands for Retrieval, Aggregation, and Delivery Object Notation. So uh, Radon, you can think of it like something like this. Basic, basically, as I said, it's abstract, so it doesn't, it, it, it's it's, it doesn't have a literal representation, it's just uh, some schema, let's say. Okay, this is not any particular language, this is, this is just representing the operator. Okay. So a script is a pipeline of calls, and here we are printing one call in each line, and a call can be either uh, the name of an, of an operator, an operator call actually, or an operator followed by one or more arguments. Uh, every operator operates on the output of the previous one and then uh, that obviously means that the final uh, value for a script will be the one of the last call. Easy. So as a type system, uh, Raven has a, um, its own type system, let's say, that is independent from uh, the one that you know for JavaScript or for Solidity or for any other languages uh, yeah, and it is strict, which means that every time that you need to change from one type to another, uh, you need to do it explicitly right now. So the types are the obvious ones, the four value types of both bool and integer float string, and there are four complex types or structures that allow for more fancy stuff, uh, more uh, functional programming knowledge. Then, uh, one nice thing is that we can take uh, radon scripts and serialize them using Seaboard, which is a standard for encoding uh, data structures into bytecode. So what we get is something like we see here, 
that we can feed into the rating engine, which is an interpreter that is a one item depth stack machine that simply uh, takes the input data that we query from APIs, for example, and start interpreting uh, the script and putting operators on it, applying operators, and then we, we get the final, um, the final result. Basically here, this script is just saying, okay, whatever do you get from the API, parse it as JSON, treat that as a map, as a hash map, let's say, key value store, and from that get the value uh, associated with a temp key, and then uh, return that as a float. So those are four calls that uh, when serialized look something like this, if you print it like JSON, and this is the X code. So we're saying <coughs> this is a really, really um, common uh, script. This one is for open weather maps, actually. So we have a, a script that says all of that. You need to parse the JSON, you need to uh, get the temp, and, and so on, in uh, barely 20 bytes, which is really, really dumb. Then, as, as I said, we can. Uh, we're not expecting people to write uh, bytecode or to do this kind of structures because uh, this is uh, not convenient at all. What we do is wrap that with a library. So we have this witness request uh, JavaScript library, which is available on MDM. And you can do just new witness script and then start pushing operators into the script just like that with the same uh, names, let's say, parse JSON as map, get them as plot, and this is actually metaprogramming. So this is, uh, you're, you're writing software that writes software for you. This is internally generating uh, the script, and the, uh, at the end, uh, when you, uh, you could add one more line, say, in to JSON, and you get this structure, for example, or you do it to Seaboard, and you get the bytecode. So they will explain how this works in practice. Oh, yeah. So basically, Alan just explained what Redon is and how it works for us. Let's see how we use them in our specific use case, right? Um, so as Alan said, we need a decentralized local network that has some major request life cycle that we need to actually um, review to understand how Redon plugs into here. So basically, we have uh, four main phases. We start by just inserting the bytecode that uh, Adam mentioned that uh, the internet request is going to be from us. And actually, when that it gets inserted into WitNet, what we have is a pool of nodes that are going to be selected to perform that task. We call those nodes witnesses. They're going to be selected randomly so that they cannot coordinate with each other and through a cryptographic sortation scheme. We use verify or random functions. So basically, once the subcommittee of the nodes is selected, what they're going to do is run the scripts that the data request specifies and get uh, the data point that the data request specifies. And but instead of just publishing the, the data point itself to the witness, what they're going to do is they're going to follow the commit review scheme. So first of all, they're going to publish a uh, secret commitment, and then they will reveal the values. This is so to prevent the, the uh, nodes copying to each other. And once um, the reveal values are published to witness, basically we run a consensus algorithm after which we get a single value, and that single value can be fed into any smart contract. Now we convert, we convert the indeterminate into determinate. Okay, and after a little bit the uh, data request the life cycle, let's uh, we start defining the real script uh, Before, let's say, like, uh, one of the cornerstones of the internet is to have multiple sources in order to, as Adam said, avoid uh, single point of failures and also to provide some uh, tamper and sensor stack properties. So, uh, radio scripts. There are three different stages. The first one is the source uh, scripts that uh, they relate to the URLs we want to produce the data from, and they could be many, as you can see. Then, the way we aggregate those data points into single data points are the aggregation scripts. It's important to say, like, both the scripts are run by the witnessing nodes, and finally, if we have different uh, witnessing nodes that are retrieving data from themselves, how do we aggregate the, this data? Uh, throughout the uh, tally space, which are actually not run by witnessing nodes, but by other kind of nodes, like the minor nodes. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so, further operation can be done by data request creators. For example, uh, set portal 
is setting the number of witnesses that uh, uh, should uh, retrieve the data. They set the fees. Uh, the data creator set the rewards and the fees, means the rewards that the witness is not will uh, obtain after executing the data request. And all the fees that uh, specify the, the rewards for all the intermediate parties that uh, are inserted <coughs> into the, into the process. And the last one is the schedule. It's a simple one, it's like a sort of time log or not before field that uh, defines the timestamp from which a data request can be executed so that we can send a data request to the Witness Network and it will stay there until the timestamp uh, is reached. Yeah. So how does uh, this everything look like, right? So in the end, uh, this is a, a schema of what we just explained in which, uh, in this case, we're uh, fetching data from three different URLs. Imagine we're fetching, for instance, the, the Bitcoin price. And what we selected is that um, we want two nodes to perform that task, right? The quorum was set to two in this case. So uh, the cryptographic sortition algorithm just, they run the cryptographic sortition algorithm and imagine Alice and Bob are eligible to actually perform that action. So what they're going to do, each of them, it, they're going to go to the sources as the script defines, they're going to retrieve the data from those sources, and then they're going to run the aggregation script so that at uh, those three points um, get aggregated into one single data point. After that, uh, they need to publish what the result they got into, into Witness. But again, I, they don't do it straight away, but they just use the commit and reveal the scheme, right? So they, they first commit the, the, the actually publish a secret commitment, and then they reveal the values. And once they reveal the values, uh, a miner, so basically it doesn't necessarily need to be Alice or Bob, just a miner can take the tally script and just apply the consensus algorithm on these two revealed values that they, they, they published. After that, again, we have a single data point that um, can serve to uh, so actually brings uh, outside data to smart contracts. Now we, have, we should have an idea how uh, random scripts work, but how they how we can uh, use random scripts uh, in other blockchains, like for example, uh, imagine we have a solid consumer contract that wants to access some data in the external world. So he has to define to write the random script, means all the parameters that we already said, and with this bytecode, uh, the contract should send send it to a window bridge interface. The window bridge interface is a solidity contract um, <coughs> that uh, acts as a sort of bulletin board. It means contracts can uh, post a data request there, and then they will be uh, uh, forward to a window bridge. Okay, so. Uh, it's also important to understand like the solidity consumer contract doesn't need to know not much about it, yes, about the posting data request, setting the parameters, and that's it. So once the data request is uh, posted into the WBI, there will be a pool of bridge nodes that they act as information relays, it means they have connection to the Wither network and also to the blockchain like Ethereum and they will listen to this contract and they will uh, realize there is a new data request. Okay, they took it and they will forward, they will claim this data request and they will forward it to the, the, the decentralized platform. Obviously, we get some incentives for doing that task and then uh, the data request will be in the Windet, used with magic habits, like when we explain already and the data will be retrieved, aggregated and so on and will be a, a result in time. So, once the result is included in a blog in the witness, again, the pool of web nodes will listen to witness and say, okay, we have uh, a result from this uh, data request ID. They will take it and they will uh, post the result to the witness that reach interface. Uh, the component you mentioned is the witness block relay, which is also a smart contract, and uh, it's, it's used by the WBI and the bridge, uh, the bridge nodes in order to validate transactions that occur in the witness and show we can prove it into in the theory. And they are using us in any other bridges, uh, sorry, we block relays, uh, SPD. And this is also a cornerstone of our architecture because it provides a tumbler to sort of system properties. And so yeah, once we have, uh, so basically we have uh, made a review of our architecture so far, right? So let's start writing scripts, right? How, how they would look like, right? So how do we write right there? For instance, the source scripts, right? Those scripts that we need to actually fetch data from sources, right? 
Well, first of all, as we said, um, it is important that we have more than one source. It's important that we not only decentralize the way we fetch data, data, but also the source of the source as well. So that's why um, we're going to have one uh, script per source that uh, we want to fetch. Um, and it's important that we choose our sources correctly, right, or wisely. Because if we feed uh, um, garbage into Witnet, Witnet will I mean, we get a uh, garbage or something, right? So that's, it is important that, that we choose reliable sources. Um, so yeah, we, we start with basically the way the uh, source scripts start is with the string um, and then as I said, we're going to see how they, we can parse it into a hash map and then uh, get um, one of the keys. The important thing is that the output is going to be an array in which uh, all, the, all the elements of the array will, will have the same type. This is important, otherwise we have to operate with that. And yeah, this array will actually, will actually reference each one of the sources that we want to avoid. Yeah, so this is kind of an example of what we just, just explained. So in this case, we're recording two sources uh, to uh, fetch a Bitcoin price. Um, so yeah, we start again, as we said, with a string here that we're going to parse the situation and we're going to treat this hash map. And in the upper case, we're going to get the last key or the value that uh, has the last um, string as key. And then here, the rate float. But notice that both of them has have a float in the end. So basically, that means that both of them, no matter how they referenced in the in the JSON. Um, so more than we want a, a float in the end of the of the, of the scripts. Okay. Now the next step is the regular animation screen. Now uh, we have obviously for, we have one animation screen for each of the records. As uh, they are also run by the things and nonce, as we already mentioned. Um, it's important to understand that the input is the output of the previous script, which is the source, it means an array, which all the, where all the items are the same type. And it ends up with a single data file. Uh, also, really important for the work that we mentioned, output will be committed and revealed uh, in the, into the And here we have a simple example. Uh, in this example, first uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll do a filter using the division standard and then a reduction with the mean. Imagine we have uh, an input of uh, an array of four elements. Then uh, the mean would be 17, but if we want to filter out the outliers, uh, let's say uh, that with those that deviate uh, more than 1.5, let's start a deviation, it means we will take out the fourth element, and then the mean will change into a more a smoothly average, let's say, uh, by almost one unit. This is normally used in order to, as I said, filter out outliers and increase the quality of the data. Yeah, so and finally the tally script, which is the one where we, which we reach consensus among those um, values that witness is reported. So it's gonna it's gonna look very much like the, the aggregation script, but uh, this time it's gonna be run by, by minor nodes. Um, and yeah, so basically it takes as input here the the, the, the data points that witness is provided from the aggregation script and it reduces it to a single value. The output again gets written into blocks and one of the this is this is how it looks like, right? You, you kind of notice that um, it's very similar to the previous one, but we have a more harsh filter here, right? So um, again, we can see how these filters are important. Then and now Mario will explain why. But notice how without the filters, the mean would have been 19.4, but with the filters, the mean the, the mean changes to 16.4. So actually, it is important to put filters. Okay, and the most important thing, or more interesting, it's like uh, this writing tally splits. Uh, right incentives design. Why? Uh, these uh, tally scripts uh, are set in the rules of a shelling game in which uh, normally the nodes, if they are not coordinated, will behave naturally and uh, in order to, prioritize, to uh, maximize the profit, they will act. Uh, the best way to do it is just to execute the script and that's it, in order to, to converge it to a single uh, focal point. Uh, also, what we, what we are doing is like those that are filtered out in this last stage, they get slashed. Uh, and then, why it is really important and critical because uh, writing telescopes could be tricky. I will provide three examples to understand them better. Imagine we, we have a, a get operator, it means we have an input, an array of the results of different witnesses nodes, and we are getting only the first item. What does mean? It means like uh, if the items are ordered, uh, there will be some kind of uh, witness node that will have more power to influence the, the result. 
or if, if they are not ordered and the, the miner choose which one is best first, he can get the result. Then another example is the filter, if we use the top, so the witnessing node, I mean, time splits are public, so the, a malicious witnessing node, he may just put uh, the biggest uh, number, uh, and then the, he will influence, he or she will influence the result. And we have the similar case with the re reduce of average without doing a field. Imagine you know there's going to be an average afterwards at the end, so you just put a super big number in order to fine tune the result that the mine only will use to tally transaction. But uh, don't be alarmed because this is really easy to identify with a, a static analysis. We can we are we are already working in the, putting this static analysis in the compiler. So any developer that is writing the analysis script, he will work like say, hey, okay, pay attention, you're doing an average uh, uh, without uh, doing a, a filter. And uh, now comes the really interesting part that is the workshop itself. So ready to make it. Okay. So uh, what we saw uh, in the examples actually mapped to something like this. Second, so I need to see both the screens. So basically, uh, this is this is using the the truffle box. We have the truffle box so that you can create a wind and power projects uh, in in just a few seconds. So you will start just by doing uh, you know truffle. And box with net travel box, something like this. I will not do it right now because it takes a minute or so, and we're not that really tight. So basically, this is a WinNet request, which is a, a small JavaScript file where I imported the WinNet request uh, library. I paid one source for Bitstamp, another for Coinless, and then I I bought the aggregator. The tally, and then I put everything together, yeah, like this. New winnet request, add source with stamp, add source with this. I set the aggregator, I set the tally, and then I decide the order. I want this data request to be uh, to be uh, performed by four different witnesses, by, by four different nodes in the network, plus two for backup. Uh, that's ex better explaining the documentation. Long story. Uh, then uh, you can set the fees for all the different stages for creating incentives for uh, the miners, including those um, those transactions into, into blocks, and you can set the schedule. In this case, uh, there's a zero, with me, which means that the request can be immediately uh, performed and it doesn't need to be done in the future. Although for many for many use cases it's much more convenient to have it scheduled for the future or we can uh, delay the publication of the request and just set it with zero, with zero and don't send it from Ethereum to Bitnet until until we know it can be it can be done. Okay. So uh, that's that's into the request for uh, for making that work. I Okay. So we just do return to compile. Okay. So when you when you do compile, all this is actually just doing node. Uh, this is big, the name big compress. This is just doing a node big compress dot yes. It's running the JavaScript. And when the JavaScript is run, it's producing the rate. Okay, so when it uh, reads the JavaScript and turns that into into Raven, it's it's uh, doing some static analysis, and it can tell that the sources are giving flows, the aggregator is giving flow, the tally is giving flow. That we can change, and we can see here which is our uh, type chain, so that we make sure that we are doing things right, and that the final type will be uh, one type that we can uh, consume from 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 solidity. So what what this did is taking that, compiling into into uh, 
<coughs> into gradient bytecode and putting that inside our contracts folder as this. So this is a solid contract that has the random bytes inside. So if we instantiate this in our solidity, solidity contracts, we have the bytes and we can send that into, into the WBI, into the Winnet Bridge interface for it to be resolved by, the, by, by Winnet. So to use it, we simply, for example, this is a very, very simple use case, uh, which is a price feed using Winnet. So what we need to do is importing the, the using Winnet library uh, and saying contract price feed is using Winnet. Then that uh, by inheritance, we are getting a lot of methods that we can use to control the, um, the data request lifecycle, sending requests, having the, re the results uh, read, and so on. So uh, here we are instantiating the, the request, new Bitcoin price request, magic, uh, and then uh, what we do is send in the request like this, with net post request, we pass the request and the, and the fee that we want to, want to set for as a reward for the bridge nodes to, to relay the, the request into, into WENAC. And then uh, when the result is ready, uh, which is guarded by this modifier, uh, we can read the result. Okay, we read the result, we get a structure called result, and this is an algebraic uh, data type that uh, allows, you, allows us, this will resemble a uh, rust or something like that. If we do it's okay, we can know that we got an actual result, there was no failure, or if something failed because the APIs failed or anything like that, we can go into a, uh, into a, a fallback case, uh, so as to recover from, from that situation. Uh, I, I used to think of this as an option for if I cannot resolve this contract in a completely trustless manner, using WinNet in an automated way, with no latency at all, I can uh, make this price bin have a really, really low latency that will work. Great. If something fails, I, I can go into some um, uh, something like Argon or something like that for recovering in that in that case. Something that that has uh, human intervention. But I want it to be 99% of the time running uh, automatically without human intervention. Yeah, because that's a, that's a point. So um, these. In addition to producing the, the contract that contains the byte like this, something else, which is uh, quite magical, which is producing a uh, default constructor arguments and migrations. So this detected that uh, inside my project, I have a uh, using women contract. So it created here uh, in the migrations folder that you will be familiar with. Uh, from um, uh, Truffle, two, two migrations. One is Winnet Core that uh, imports all the uh, Winnet Toolkit, let's say. And this, uh, what does, what it's doing is detecting if we are on a public Ethereum network. And if we are in a public Ethereum network, it will link all the things related to the with the bridge interface and the block relay and so on. And if we are in a private network, it will deploy an instance of the WBI and everything and link it that into your, into your contracts. And the most beautiful part is that it wrote also the, the migrations for my contract and it inserted the, uh, the default <coughs> argument. So it, it, de it detects, it, it can read the signature of the constructor of your contracts and put default values so that you uh, you only need to uh, manually set uh, anything that has not the default value, let's say. But for example, it detected that the contract is expecting the address of the Winnet Bridge interface, so it passed the, the, address, the address right there. Because, uh, okay, what we, the Winnet Bridge interface that is uh, live right now, uh, it's just some reference implementation that we made, but we expect uh, other developers to create other implementations that may work in a different way, but there is just an interface, so it's a standard interface as long as you uh, 
abide by that inter interface. Internally, it can work differently, so the developers have the freedom to use another within uh, the bridge interface that is not the, uh, the one provided by, by us. So, going back to slides. I just put it here, just in case uh, the, <coughs> it didn't work. Yeah. So, on the feature frame, uh, one, one, the, first, the first thing about, we can think about is going beyond HTTPS, HTTPS. Basically, right now, um, Radon is focused on processing payloads coming from uh, GET requests, uh, don't use in HTTP, but we can think of other initiators uh, like uh, taking um, uh, data from IPFS, SWORM, uh, Filecoin, and so on, or even reacting to Web3 events. So basically, giving your contracts the capability of, of serving the events uh, thrown by other uh, Ethereum contracts or uh, Ethereum contracts, uh, solidity contracts that live on another uh, Ethereum network, which is something quite interesting, uh, or even uh, querying authenticated APIs. Uh, one other thing we are working on is uh, allowing some implicit uh, conversions, so basically getting rid of the as map, as flow thing, and so on. But we can do that because the operators are actually defined as a string parts JSON, bytes as map, and so on. So they are already explicit of uh, from which type to which type. So we can uh, remove that because uh, it becomes uh, obvious at some point. And this, this is one thing that we are also quite excited about, is that because of how Seaboard works, so Seaboard, uh, as uh, encoding for data structures, it needs to encode uh, both the values and how the values relate to each other, so how, how what's the hierarchy. And because of that, normally there's some kind of expansion, for example, for representing a 45 Hexadecimal here, it's using two bytes, 18, 45. So uh, there's some optimization here, which is for small integers. Small integers only take one byte because they are, if, if the value is below 25 or above minus 25, uh, it, it automatically uh, guesses that it, it, it knows that it's an integer. Um, so we can. Uh, turn this script into this other, in which we are doing basically uh, modulo uh, 16 for all the operators, and as we uh, know the chain of types, we know actually um, that 5 here actually means 45, 1 is 61, and so on, and we can leverage that uh, the way that symbol works, and we turn those operators from two bytes into a single byte and in this case uh, the reduction is around 30 percent because we have literals but in the scripts where we have a very low amount of literals and we are just uh, dealing with um, changing the shape of the data and, and not um, using gets like this or, and so on we can get up to 50 percent uh, safe, which is uh, very important for lear for long-term scalability of, of the network. Also, uh, you can feel that we think of Radon as something that goes beyond WITNET, beyond Oracle networks, actually, because uh, it's a, at the end of the day, it's a versatile DSL for performing uh, data flows, for defining data flows and performing operations on, on the way. So it could be used not other for doing it, but for other oracles, for writing scrappers, for taking data from, from anywhere, uh, for making extra transform and load tools, which are 
uh, quite common in the banking industry, for example. Uh, and so the work we will be doing with Braden in the medium term is making a generalization uh, and, and detaching it from the cabinet from, from women uh, so that we can have a higher order radon in which uh, developers can uh, define their own stages, define their own operators and so on and just leverage, uh, let's say, the, 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 um, the abstract uh, syntax behind and all the tooling but uh, they can transform that into uh, serving their, their use case. So, uh, <laughs> when will we be able to use uh, within from Ethereum mainnet? Okay, we are we are we are almost there. Okay, so uh, Winnet itself uh, has its own blockchain. You know, it's like a side chain to, to Ethereum. It's side chain by the schema we we uh, saw before with the block relay and so on. So right now the the Winnet testnet is connected to uh, two different uh, Ethereum testnets, RingDB and Burley, and it's pretty to play with. Uh, the, all the tooling is right there. We are working heavy on uh, improving the documentation and so on. Right now, in the official documentation, docs.winnet.io, uh, you have a, a really comprehensive tutorial for creating the price feed that we uh, that we saw before, and it's uh, right now undergoing audits, and we are doing a lot of stress testing uh, for the for the following months. Uh, we also want to work on more bridges to uh, because the idea of Winnet is that, in some way, blockchain agnostic. I mean that it's it's bound to uh, serve as many different uh, smart contract platforms uh, as possible and uh, it's expected to, to be launched on mainnet for early net, next year. So, uh, <coughs> the price feed is a very low level primitive for writing things like DeFi uh, utilities but uh, on top of that, we can create many uh, funny things um, in, in a really, really easy way and in a decentralized way that was not possible before. So, uh, for especially for DevCon, we try to uh, push <laughs> the limits of uh, what we have right now, of all the tooling and what Witness is right now, and we came up with this small that, that that you can use. It's called coinprice.bit. It's uh, on RingKB only, sorry. Uh, hopefully, uh, in a few months, we can migrate that uh, into mainnet. And basically, it's a prediction market for uh, the um, coin prices. Um, mm -hmm. ah, let's see. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Okay. So you can try to predict which uh, which uh, coin will be performing best tomorrow. So uh, you can see here all the all the prediction volumes for each different um, for each different coin for each different cryptocurrency. Right now it is winning, no surprise. Uh, and here are your predictions. So we can. Ah, I, th I think I can double down on, on it. So let's uh, let's go with E Ethereum 0.2 cent prediction. <coughs> so this is uh, for tomorrow's market. So today I can predict what will happen tomorrow, and as soon as tomorrow finishes. I can uh, withdraw my price if I if I'm one of the winners. You can see your your potential win for for you for each option. And then, for example, we can see here uh, uh, just yesterday's market. Uh, the predictions for yesterday are are closed. Uh, okay, this work uh, opened yesterday, but this is the market for today. Actually, this is. Uh, tracking what is happening today. So, uh, 
tonight, this will be closed, and uh, and what will happen is that the contract behind this will uh, send the data request to WebNet. WebNet will attest what's the actual result, uh, consuming from three different uh, price APIs. It will aggregate everything and push the result into the smart contract behind the tab, and it will uh, allow the ones that voted for the most performing crypto to take a share of the of the price. Okay. So uh, make sure to to check every day so that you can see how the markets evolve and which are the winners, and hopefully get some. Uh, Bring the okay. So are the witness nodes only you guys right now behind this? No. Okay. Actually, uh, it's it's totally live and open for anyone to run a testnet node. It's uh, crazy simple. I can install one right now. Uh, like uh, Docker, run it with that with that trust. Latest <coughs> no. <coughs> it needs to download the binary. <laughs> 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 so, so it, this will spawn a node in the Windows uh, testnet. It's a server. Of course. Yeah, maybe uh, can, you, uh, can you challenge or uh, verify the execution of the tally on chain? Yeah, what, what happens is that as soon as you have the rebuilds, anyone, everyone knows the tally scripts, so they can pre-compute which is the result of the tally, and anyone can verify. As the tallies are written into blocks, what it, that means is that uh, other nodes reject blocks that contain wrong tallies. Is that on the side chain or the main chain? That's that's done on the side chain. Then uh, the result is brought back to to Ethereum, for example, and that's verified. So the the Winnet Bridge interface actually verifies the transaction uh, through SPV, let's say. So it verifies that that transaction belongs to Winnet and that that has been accepted as the by the Winnet network as the tally for that particular uh, request. So this is now sinking, you know, blockchains. <laughs> Some of the ways you know, right now. What, what happens to, to fees and like witness reputation if you have either a persistent or intermittent error on like the API, like one witness so gets 500, the other three get a valid response? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's quite important. Uh, <clears throat> there are two, two different things. Um, APIs can, fa can fail out of the blue, and it, it's true that uh, no one should take really a hit from, from that, because they are not guilty for that, for the, the witnessing notes. So what happens is that uh, the slashing right now is on reputation, so there's actually some reputation system behind this, which simply uh, it's a score of how uh, often how often every single node uh, <coughs> was part of the majority, let's say, uh, how often they were not filtered out by tally functions, by tally scripts, random tally scripts. So uh, it's important to, dis like, to design the tallies very, very well so as not to do that kind of stuff. But then it's true, uh, one, some attacker would come with some crazy request that queries really, really shitty APIs so as to damage the system, but actually the way that the reputation system works uh, kind of uh, prevents that because reputation is really volatile and, and changes hands really, really fast and uh, if, you, if, you, if you try to plan such a thing, the, the, the point is that you cannot um, decide who to punish, actually, because the because the witnesses are randomly selected. So, okay, I will cause some nodes to be punished and some others to be rewarded. But I don't know who they are. 
So this, what it's doing actually is just accelerating the way that the system redistributes reputation be, be, uh, between many different nodes. Because at, at the end of the day, the reputation also has uh, some demo reach, which means that just because you have reputation, you lose it. So basically, it decays over time, it, it, it expires, so you cannot hold the, your reputation for, forever, and it's always changing hands. So if you do that, you just get you are just uh, accelerating that, that process. So it, it's it's good for the system, actually. <laughs> Sorry, I just hope you didn't understand how it's been to explain what. Is, the, is that written out? If I read the white paper, is that written out? It sounds really interesting and totally confusing. <laughs> so, okay, you can you can read the white paper. What we implemented in, those, in these two years uh, is 90 something percent of what we outlined in the white paper. Uh, we have recently published a new documentation site that is really, really stripped down into the basics and into really understanding what, uh, what we are doing here. Uh, so I think that will be quite clarifying because the, the uh, white paper is quite extensive. But, but we are constantly also publishing uh, a lot of content, uh, research content, and Tech, really technical content on, on our video blog and over specific areas like the repetition system, uh, rain on uh, many different parts and I think you, you will like that. So, uh, okay, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I hope you, you enjoyed it.